Okay, uh, good morning or good evening uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, so today we'll have, uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Dr. Philip Irkujo from the University of Melbourne in Australia. He is uh, one of the most outstanding uh, young scientists on Bell 2. He served as uh, analysis coordinator of the experiment for a number of years. And he's currently uh, the convener of the so-called performance group. He'll talk to us about Bell 2 and beyond, and we'll explain this very exciting picture on the lower right. So please go ahead, Phil. Thanks very much, Tom, and thanks very much for the organizers of the Future Flavors Conference. It's, yeah, it's a pleasure to, to be able to, to give a talk on behalf of Bell 2 on physics analyses that are ongoing at the moment with the brand new data sets and what we expect to do uh, with the data sets in the near future with the Super Kek B, uh, uh, collisions as pictured. Typically, when it comes to a long-term uh, flavor program, you need a long-term vision. And we usually drive that with, with open questions. And you might be able to apply some of these to other, other experiments for sure. But I think these ones are all really quite applicable to uh, E plus E minus near Upsilon 4S. So firstly, are there new CP violating phases in the quark sector? We know the universe is missing all its antimatter, but we don't know why. We're looking at quark mixing and beta decays, uh, new sources of CP violation. Uh, we look, we're using CKM precision metrology. And from, uh, from a phenomenology uh, perspective, we also need to disentangle strong phases. So we need to know what we're doing. We can't just make a direct measurement. We need to really understand uh, the, the mechanisms uh, that can give rise to CP violation. Secondly, we want to know why the why the universe has three families of fermions, these three copies of things with, with different masses, but are essentially the same. Maybe it's got something to do with having more Higgs bosons. Uh, a type of measurement that you can do to look for this is you look for a lepton flavor universality violation. And this has shown up as a fairly significant uh, hints or anomalies of new physics in more recent years. I'll go through some that, that are being worked on with Bell 2. The third one is the, the, the W. It's left-handed. For some reason, we have this chiral structure in the standard model in nature from what we can see, but we, we can't easily explain why. Uh, perhaps there is a right-handed counterpart that is much heavier, uh, and there are really good ways to do this through studies of weak, weak decays of bees. And another thing that's become really popular in more recent years is the prevalence or um, prevalence of searches for dark sectors and the concept that dark, dark matter could be uh, rather complex and involve interactions with ordinary matter in a very feeble way. So we're looking for feeble type of interactions, dark photons, axion-like particles, and uh, dark matter via flavor transitions. This is a picture that's been taken from uh, the Bell 2 Snowmass uh, program associated to upgrades and the, the physics program in general. You can see there are many, many uh, arms from uh, for many arms corresponding to, to areas of physics analysis. I'm going to cover a few, but you can you can continue on and do study uh, many more areas of physics if you're interested. So coming back to CCAN metrology, this is kind of the bread and butter physics of a B factory. The, the principle is that we're measuring the CK matrix elements and we're measuring the amount of uh, CP violation in the standard model. Uh, we can measure the amount of CP violation uh, by uh, performing direct, uh, by performing measurements of direct, indirect, uh, uh, and indirect uh, uh, CP violation in channels such as JSIK, beta pi pi, and beta dk and d pi. The CK matrix elements are measured typically with uh, uh, semi-leptonic and leptonic transitions. Uh, these are uh, the ones over here from beta decays. Uh, you can extract similar ones with charm, uh, neutron, and K on decay. Putting all of this together, particularly the measurement of the CP phases and the CK matrix elements allows us to uh, test for new phenomena uh, in different types of comparisons. We can look at tree only versus loop only, CP conserving versus CP violating to uh, determine a potential patterns for new phenomena that can come through. The other type of physics that we like to do, particularly in B decay, is looking for missing particle leptonic and semi-leptonic signatures. 
on the first category, we've got flavor changing neutral currents uh, that, that can give rise to dilepton final states. A second one was associated to these feeble interactions and new particles uh, that may uh, disappear. So ALPs or Higgs-like scalars or dark photons. This third one is on forbidden decays. Uh, essentially you break something like a lepton flavor number or lepton number, uh, or it happens to be uh, highly suppressed. And the last one is on leptonic decays, it specifically tests of lepton flavor universality in this particular scenario. So those two major categories, one is CK and precision tests and studies of CP violation and missing energy and leptonic signatures are two of the bigger themes for a B factory. Okay, so let's look at the collision environment now. Uh, most of our data is collected near the Upsilon 4S. Uh, this allows us to produce coherent B meson pairs, but we also take a little bit of data that's just below, around about 60 MeV below, uh, to collect background. This is very important to be able to suppress, uh, to, to understand what that background looks like, to suppress it, uh, and to subtract it if, if need be. The, the cross, cross section for uh, continuum core production is around about four times that of, of B production. So that, that's why that's so important. Um, the environment, uh, because uh, particles are produced near rest and we wanna be able to reconstruct everything for, for doing a complete set of physics analyses, we want the detector to be hermetic. We also want it to be very good at reconstructing neutrals uh, such as gammas and pi zeros. We also need to find as many charged particles as possible. We want the tracking to be as efficient down to very low momenta. Uh, that means that we need to pick up up to you know, 15 to 20 uh, tracks and neutrals in an event. Well, um, of course, uh, Super B has been operating and breaking luminosity records. Uh, this is a picture from the 21st of April, so a couple of weeks ago. You can see uh, pretty much a record breaking day of a peak luminosity of 3.7 by 10 to the 34 uh, per centimeter squared per second. Uh, that's, that's what's been achieved. And here is, the, is well, here ballpark is one of roughly the, the, uh, uh, the target. This is already in excess of what was achieved at KB and that's the, the main comparison here. We're almost double that now. So that was the previous uh, peak. As for the experiment, well, almost all of the experiments constructed, all, almost all of the experiment is there uh, and has been there since uh, the year 2019 and operating. Uh, the exception is that there's part of the vertex detector that's not quite there. It's a, currently operating as mostly a one layer pixel detector uh, surrounded by a four layer SVD. And I'll come back to this. This is part of the, the upgrade program for the future. Uh, outside of that, of course, we've got a drift chamber, which allows us to measure track momenta. Uh, that first one is vertex detector because it, it, it re reconstructs vertices. Um, next can, comes the particle identification detectors that are primarily used for um, separation of kaons and pions, but can also be used to separate out leptons. Then there's the calorimeter, which is fantastic for neutrals, also very important for, uh, for electron identification. And then beyond that is the, the KLM. This is outside the solenoid. So the data that's been collected uh, from these collisions to date has, has grown to a, a level that's achieving, uh, is starting to achieve super B factory performance. As I showed you, the, the peak Lumi is almost double that now. Uh, and the in integrated data collected per day is up to around two and a half inverse femtobarns. Sorry about this typo here. Um, that corresponds to about 15 inverse femtobarns a week. And this, this you can see from, from the graph. The goals though, as shown over here, um, we're, we're coming up to a, a long shut, shutdown period. Um, and uh, so we'll continue to take data for a bit longer and then we'll, we, we head into a, a shutdown period um, before opening back up in a, in a border uh, a year's time before continuing on. I'll come back to what, what's going into these periods. So what about the performance of the detector? We need to know that it works as well uh, at least as well as Bell. Uh, firstly, I'll talk about neutrals and vetoes. So here we've got photon efficiencies. Uh, over here, we can measure the photon efficiencies using uh, tagged events. And we, we, we can see that the efficiencies and the data versus MC for these efficiencies uh, is, is very good. Uh, our particle identification for neutrals is also quite good. 
So we use this particle identification to separate out photons from, from K-longs. And you can see here, we can, we can, we can achieve that using uh, the calorimetry uh, alone using pulse shape discrimination. And on the right-hand side, I've got uh, recent results on uh, track efficiencies down to low momenta. And you can see that the track finding efficiencies are uh, in excess of 90%. Uh, plus we can measure their systematic errors uh, very well. Uh, this shows you that when we check data MC agreement on our, our data on our tracking, our Monte Carlo is working uh, as expected. Now, next comes uh, lepton reconstruction. A lot of the channels that I talked about actually have an electron or muon in the final state. And it's very important to have good universe, universality in the efficiency if you can do it. So an experiment like Bell 2 can do this. Here I've got uh, a collection of uh, J psi events going to plus e minus and a collection going to mu plus mu minus. You can see that one of them is a little bit broader than the other. The electron loses energy via Bremsstrahlung in the material. Um, that's due to the amount of material that's in, in front of the detector. So in, in Bell 2, in front of the tracking volume, there's actually about uh, 0.1 radiation length. This isn't so much, and that's why this tail isn't particularly large, but in the case of LHC experiments, it's significantly larger. Okay, next comes lepton identification. So you've reconstructed it, but can you tell the difference between an electron and a pion? So for electrons, we often use information that comes from the calorimeter here, as well as information from ionization energy loss through the, the drift chamber. Um, this, this I've got pictured here for an electron and a pion. We can see that their likelihoods are separated out quite well for the CDC and exceptionally well for the calorimeter. In the case of muons, um, we generally rely heavily on the muon detector, the KLM muon detector above around 700 MeV. That's enough to get past the solenoid. Um, and we can also use the calorimeter at the low end. And this actually shows you how we can, we can do so uh, with the respective likelihoods for separation. Then we throw it all into a machine learner and we get very good fake rates. Uh, we get uh, fake rates of order 1% uh, in the case of electrons at a 90% efficiency and a few percent in the case of, of muons, other, a few percent as you can see here. Now that's, one of our goals is actually to measure very low momenta such that we can suppress uh, background to measurements that contain towels uh, because they generally have low momentum leptons. Uh, next we've got a key analysis steps. Uh, so the environment um, that the E plus E minus environment gives us well-defined kinematics from the beam energies. And we can uh, measure these to a few, few MeV of precision. So we generally rely on beam energy constraint mass and beam energy difference parameters uh, for background constraints. Uh, furthermore, we can mitigate a lot of the continuum background in our events using spherical versus jet-like uh, topologies. So spherical for bees and jet-like for a continuum. Other tools that we can use <clears throat> are on tagging. So of course, we always produce bees in, in pairs like this. If you've got um, a signal side like this one with at least one vis invisible decay product, uh, you can constrain the kinematics of that neutrino using the kinematics of the other side. So we do this often with techniques like FEI, which does this complex set of full reconstruction of, of the tag side B. But we've also got um, a machine learned uh, complex uh, algorithms that can determine flavor with very high efficiency. So instead of worrying about the full kinematics, you're just worried about the flavor of the B quark, uh, you, you can do that too. So to summarize, I won't go through this whole table. Um, the, the current level of systematic errors and performance of Bell 2 in the current data sets is now essentially reaching uh, that of Bell, except for a couple of places where, you, where we have uh, slightly larger uh, statistical errors because our data set is just still growing at the moment. Uh, yeah, so I'm not going to go through all these. That's just a general remark that the performance now is as good or better uh, than uh, the predecessor. Okay, so let's start looking at a few different areas. Um, first one I mentioned was on, on CP violation. So the big goal right now is to improve the measurement of unitarity triangle uh, measurements. 
at the moment, they're all good to around five to 10% on individual constraints. That actually leaves a lot of room if you want to uh, throw new physics effects into the mixing Hamiltonian, for example. So if you want to measure, if you want to compare um, new physics that enters via that loop and, and versus ones that don't. So the three main categories are, of course, measurements of phi one. The single most precise measurement at the moment comes from Bell. And in practice, it's statistics limited. Uh, we can continue to, to improve this for quite some time. Then uh, phi two, this is dominated by Bell and Babar. Its precision is around 6%. There's a lot of room to improve here. And this will, I'll, I'll get back to. And on phi three, at the moment, this is completely dominated, I have to say, uh, from LHCV, which can uh, achieve a precision here of uh, four degrees on the measurement of phi three. Uh, however, having said that, um, there's now an effort to improve the statistical power of the of the B factory measurements, and that and so this effort uh, was one where both Bell and Bell two data were combined uh, in a model independent dialects analysis, uh, which was recently published. And you can see here that the precision is around eleven degrees. It's consistent with the previous result, and you you essentially what you do is you measure uh, uh, the B two D H, so K short H, H, uh, H uh, 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 channels. Uh, this is um, the uh, reconstruction in the Bell data set. So 711 inverse femtobans bands there and Bell two. Something you, you'll notice actually is that the uh, separation between the two peaks here, that the uh, pi on one on the right and the K on one. So that's H equals K here and H equals pi here is much better in the case of Bell two. So uh, just, a, just a good example of how the statistical power of the data set uh, uh, has, has improved. Uh, we expect that it'll hit the current LHCV precision uh, with around 10 inverse autobahns, uh, but there's many channels to add here. So the prospects might be better. On phi two, you can extract this from three isospin related decays. Uh, for example, I mentioned pi pi and rho pi, but rho rho is an excellent uh, method as well. Um, so rho, rho, uh, rho plus rho zero, the neutrals as well. Um, yeah, this is an example reconstruction of the channel rho plus rho zero, so a charged V, where the direct CPA symmetry was measured. Current level of precision is getting close to the world average. Uh, this is with 190 inverse vampire bonds. Um, and uh, this is the kind of uh, analysis that uh, is required as input uh, to the global, uh, global extraction of phi two. So more channels will need to be added and then this can convert into a phi two uh, alone from, from Bell two, which would be great. The a challenging type of measurement is the measurement of phi one. So phi one requires that you uh, measure the displacement between uh, the tag side and the signal side B delta Z, and you can relate that to delta T, which goes into the time-dependent mixing measurement. Uh, you also need to know what the flavor was for that tag side. Mentioned that before. At present, the at flavor tagging efficiency for Bell 2 is comparable uh, to that of Bell. It's been measured and published earlier this year. Crucial inputs for this are the vertex resolution, so how well you actually uh, measure these two positions, and that tagging efficiency, tagging efficiency input. Uh, for Bell 2, we actually had a, a reduced boost with respect to Bell. Um, and that means that you have to generally have to compensate a lot for the reduced resolution, sorry, for the re reduced displacement. Uh, but this, this is done by having a closer vertex detector layer. So something closer to the beam pipe. Uh, so I've got a picture of that um, up here, essentially. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go through this one. Um, so the solution for, for it was uh, a combination of both nano beams uh, with the vertex detector. So firstly, with nano beams, you get an effective bunch length that's much smaller. Uh, that's about one tenth, and the vertex resolution uh, for Bell uh, also reduced uh, is, is reduced by a factor of two. So the old Z vertex distribution used to be around ten times larger than this. This is five hundred microns. In the case of the D zero and the Z zero, so these impact parameter resolutions. 
uh, from Bell through to Bell 2. Uh, these came down by a factor of two. Uh, this is Monte Carlo, and this is extracted directly from data. So it was very close to our expectation. You can see it's of the order of uh, 12 to 20 microns. So this was um, measured in a something more than a demonstrator analysis, but I'll, I'll use it in that context. Um, and that's the measurement of the charm lifetimes. So the charm lifetimes D and D plus uh, were extracted. Essentially, you determine uh, the, the production point uh, from the collision kinematics uh, and measure the displacement, so the flight path. And that flight path can be measured to uh, a resolution, in this case, of around 40 microns. And that gives you uh, world best measurements of the charm lifetime. So this is an excellent example that time dependent CP violation can be performed, um, but on the way measuring these uh, to PRL level. Okay, so that brings me on to the next bit, which is actual measurement of mixing and lifetimes. Uh, around 40,000 events were reconstructed in D star and D8, D star and D plus a hadron, uh, where that was a K or a pion. And you can see uh, this reconstructed in delta E, as this, this is the typical distribution you use for the extraction. So this is the uh, um, D pi component, this is the DK component. And uh, then you measure the mixing parameter, uh, delta MD, uh, from a time dependent measurement of mixing. And that gives you an asymmetry and from the amplitude, uh, sorry, from, from the period of that uh, uh, asymmetry oscillation, you, you pull out the delta MD. This is comparable to previous results, uh, but the, the precision isn't quite as good as the, the best done by Bell. And that's probably due to, we'll just need to add it, the, the channel that was used in that previous analysis. Anyway, um, the systematics are much lower and we're ready to tackle phi one. Okay, on time dependent, um, time dependent measurements beyond CKM metrology, uh, we look at uh, channels like K short pi zero. This one we look at because it, it proceeds via a gluonic penguin diagram. And this means that it's potentially sensitive to, uh, to new physics in a way that uh, uh, other processes like JSIK short tree level ones are not as sensitive. So the idea is that you can measure the uh, time dependent, um, sorry, you can measure the amplitude of the cosine and the sine terms uh, in the time dependent uh, CP asymmetry. Uh, these, uh, these, these are useful uh, potentially um, in a precise uh, determination of uh, the isospin uh, sum rule test. Essentially, this relation here uh, cancels out uncertainties due to uh, uh, QCD-related uh, theoretical uncertainties. That gives you a precise null test of zero. But it critically relies on the input of the uh, cosine amplitude term and the branching fraction of the neutral modes. This is the least well-determined. So this is actually extracted from a time-dependent analysis. Uh, where you could simultaneously uh, fit this and this um, to k short pi zero. It's very experimentally challenging because uh, pi zero doesn't give you a good vertex. And this is a, this is a long lived particle, so it's challenging. In any case, uh, Bell2 pulled out a preliminary result on this, uh, and this will soon become uh, something quite competitive and useful for this kind of test. This is a really good one for new physics. So what about the future? Um, that was one such measurement. Um, so obviously, uh, phi one is very important, but so is time dependent CP violation in B to QQS of, of different uh, quark types. Uh, the delta T resolution is very good. So we're not going to be, uh, we're definitely going to get better systematics. And there are several categories that we'll be looking for. I mentioned tree, mentioned gluonic penguins. Um, uh, and th these are the two main categories. There are others that are important as syst for systematic errors. So in the future, we'll expect Bell2 to dominate a lot of the channels that I've got listed here and for the precision to continually improve and be almost entirely statistics limited for almost all of these. Okay, I'll get onto something that's maybe uh, a lot more popular these days <laughs> in a sense, and that's uh, anomalies in the form of semi-leptonic and dileptonic uh, anomalies. All right, the, the one on the left is one that's been persistent for really quite a long time. 
And it's associated to the extractions of the CK matrix elements VUB and VCB. The, the top right dot here is the extraction via inclusive methods. Oops. And the fit here, but the, the, the um, bands here uh, are via exclusive methods. The ones that I would compare to directly would be the blue and the green band so around this point. Uh, orange is an uh, independent result taken from uh, mostly baryonic inputs from the L from LHCB. In, 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 any, in any case, uh, there's actually really a, a large difference between uh, the extractions of these parameters. And it's of order of three sigma. Uh, it's, it's an open question. I'll get, I'll get to what the current status is a little bit more later. Uh, on the right-hand side, we've got our test of LFUV. So our ratio of D star tau nu over light lepton channels. And of course we do this because not because we want to measure anything fundamental, we want to search for a charge Higgs or say electroquark. The current status of this is that the world average in red is uh, off the, the, the theoretical prediction, this being the more common one to take by more than three sigma. I should note that if you base your uh, prediction purely on lattice QCD, it's a couple of sigma away. Uh, this is uh, maybe a detail. It's not the only type of anomaly. Um, so this is our tree uh, V minus A current uh, here, going to uh, measured in D and D star or measured uh, in beta pi or inclusive XU. And of course, we've got tensions both in VUB and VCB and in RD star. There's also tensions, of course, in beta SLL. These are loop processes. Uh, similar types of observables, branching fractions, angular observables. And we've got also discrepancies, but in this case, in the ratios of mu versus E and in branching fractions. I'll come back to this one after I go through these. So in more, in more recently, um, uh, uh, Beltu is providing input on the VUB uh, inclusive exclusive puzzle by improving the measurements of, of VUB. Here we use that tag method in beta pi e nu and perform a likelihood fit to the missing mass squared distribution. So essentially that's your initial collision minus the tag minus the pion. on, um, yeah, and minus the electron. Uh, that gives you the, the missing, missing mass and it peaks for the signal and it's actually pretty clean. Uh, however, because of the tag, the efficiency is low and you can see in this particular channel only about 15 events in this region. So we then fit this with lattice QCD information and pull out a value of VUB. And we get a number of about 3.9 by uh, plus uh, minus 0.45. So it's just over 10% precision already with uh, a fraction of the, the Bell data set. But uh, yeah, all of the available Bell 2 at that time. We expect that to continually improve with more data, of course. Um, this is not a Bell 2 result, it's a Bell 1, but it was just made public uh, about two weeks ago. And this is a measurement of VUB on VCB. And it's something I, I'll, I'll point out because my student did it. <laughs> uh, so it's a Bell analysis with Bell 2 software and the BTAG framework. And the idea here was to measure the ratio to cancel out a lot of experimental systematic errors. And uh, we determine the background here using a data-driven uh, method from a veto sample. So that's where you have a, a non-zero number of kaons, which, which uh, indicates that it's a background from uh, a, a cascade of a B to a charm to a strange quark. You can see here, the signal component is, is excess is clear in, the, in the, the category with no kaons. So using a data-driven approach to correct the spectrum where you can see there's a discrepancy, uh, we then uh, fit to Q squared and lepton momentum and determine the ratio. We don't have theoretical predictions for the extraction of VUB on VCB from that ratio yet, but we can, we can multiply through by that branching fraction at the moment and, and get some values of VUB. So comparing that to that beta pi new result, uh, well, not that one, the world average, uh, the new study is here. And the one that was published uh, in the past year from Bell uh, using a complementary techniques uh, is almost the same central value, but uh, with low statistical overlap. So you can see that now we've brought down 
the tension uh, with respect to the previous page uh, by, by quite a bit, I think we're, we're closing in on that gap. Bell two, I think is gonna have to finally resolve it though. Okay, uh, then for the heavy to heavy, we've got VCB. Uh, we usually reconstruct this in a semi-leptonic channel like D star L nu, and then measure uh, the, the W distribution. This is a hadronic recoil distribution. And the reason why we do that is because hadronic recoil uh, uh, is uh, important for the theoretical calculation. Um, when you want to theoretically describe a transition like this, um, you relate the, the decay differential to a form factor and then VCB squared. You can precisely calculate that form factor if the initial meson and the final state meson have fully overlapping wave functions. So that means that the D star is at rest in, in the B frame. So our, what we really like, want to get is the kind of overlap down here at W equals one. That's, that's <laughs> the information we really want is down at this point. Actually, so that means that the key challenge is detection of slow pions because this corresponds to very slow pions. Experimentally, that's much better in Bell 2. So we expect the systematics to be significantly better than, than in previous. In any case, this measurement was uh, performed and we pull out an exclusive value of VCB, which is uh, on the way to, to high precision and uh, uh, not, not there yet, uh, but um, highly statistics limited at this point. At this point. Uh, on top of this, uh, there's been a lot of new input from Lattice QCD. So I mentioned that you want to calculate, you compare your measurement at hadronic uh, uh, recoil of zero. So this particular configuration. Uh, there's now been non-zero Lattice QCD inputs that were brought into the field last year. And it kind of transforms how we do these measurements. So uh, Bell, Bell actually published some untagged uh, data for this. And you can relate... Uh, essentially, you can measure the decay differentials in, in, in three different angles. And W, this is related to a theoretical expression in terms of helicity amplitudes. And then we can write out those helicity amplitudes as, a, as an expansion. Down here, um, what we can also do is extract uh, where we can take predictions for a helicity term, sorry, the form factor terms from lattice and constrain them heavily uh, as well as fit to the Bell data. And what we found was that uh, if whether or not you included that information, um, it, it turned out that the results were incredibly consistent, just that the, th the uncertainties had, had, had uh, come down. So essentially, um, without, without much lattice in information, we get a, a value that's similar to the black line here. And then through different other configurations, uh, we see very little uh, variation across uh, the fit results. It was, it was very interesting, um, but it, it says that the, the, the puzzle on the VCB side is still open. Now, I didn't mention LFUV yet. Uh, so what about that? Uh, there aren't any measurements out from Bell 2 at the moment. So let me just talk about the prospects for these. Um, here, I showed you this figure before. The single most precise measurement came from Bell in 2019 using Bell 2 data analysis software. Uh, there was a simultaneous measurement of beta D tau nu and D star tau nu. And that's how uh, this, this could be uh, extracted here. And the approach was to use a semi-leptonic B tag on the tag side. Um, in the future, of course, with more data, uh, you'll you'll do uh, this measurement again, of course, with more data, you'll do hadronic tag. You look at different decay channels of the tau lepton. You look at polarization. Uh, you can look at the uh, Q squared spectrum. There's a lot more observables that will open up once you've got more data. In any case, we expect these, uh, these curves here uh, to, to really um, be uh, uh, greatly reduced in size. Uh, RD, for example, is highly statistics limited. And the systematics on the D star channel are also data driven. Okay, um, so what about the other the other anomaly, the light lepton anomaly? Um, we've got RK star. Um, now, in the case of the tau channel, uh, it was 
it's clear to see that it's very challenging. You don't reconstruct the tau, you reconstruct the, the tau's decay products. Here, you reconstruct the electron and you reconstruct the muon. So you, you would expect it experimentally um, to, to have less, uh, less issues. In any case, um, with, the, with corrections for phase space differences, the ratio should be very close to one. And you can see here a summary of the results right up to the most recent nature uh, nature publication from LHCB, which is about three sigma away uh, from one. The results on RK, uh, RK star, uh, RK short through other channels are also away from one, although every result from Bell has been roughly consistent. So of course, this could be some kind of leptoquark, it could be uh, some kind of new phenomena. So the early measurements, this is a highly statistics limited analysis. So the first thing you would do at a B factory is look for a control mode, uh, this case, K star LL. So this is a preliminary result that just came out um, for which uh, branching fractions are, are extracted. Here, J psi going to EE and J psi going to be mu uh, are reconstructed. You can see delta E, they're very clean. Uh, and uh, the resolution of these peaks is really quite similar uh, with respect to what you'd see at LHCB. Same deal for the, <clears throat> for the electron and muon modes. In that case, we can use the beam energy constraint mass and the resolution is really pretty much the same. Uh, we're starting to find a KLL uh, in the, the Bell 2 data set. Uh, this was with a 60 inverse femtobahn analysis from last year. And uh, it, it will take a few more years before we, we can make it an impact on this one. And I'll, I'll go through those numbers. Um, looking at the most recent K star LL, this is with 189 inverse femtobahns. Uh, we were able to extract branching fractions of K star mu mu and EE, and the precision on these extractions is only around uh, two and a half times that of the PDG uh, with the small data set. So for the branching fractions, we're expecting to be competitive once we hit an inverse adder bar and that's you know, five times the data. The, the main goal here is to give independent checks of RK star anomalies and RK uh, as soon as we can. Um, measure the inclusive ones that you can't do uh, at LHCB and get some um, absolute branching fraction measurements as well to really start constraining potential systematic errors. So what, what's, gonna go, what's gonna happen in the future? Here I've got some benchmarks where we expect that with five inverse adder bonds, we hit 10% precision on all of these uh, types of measurements, whether it's exclusive or some of, it in, some of exclusive or inclusive. Uh, this is probably going to be around 2026, hopefully. Uh, uh, we'll have uh, the, uh, a long shutdown in, in the interim. Uh, a great, uh, so if you've got new physics in beta K star LL and you want to find out really what it is and you want to reduce your, your overall un theoretical uncertainties, an excellent approach is to use the neutral modes, new, new bar. It's also a complementary probe of new physics. There's other things that can come in this one. Uh, so with around 63 inverse femtobahns of Bell 2 data, this, this channel was measured. It was published last year. It was by far the most um, statistically powerful per inverse femtobahn uh, of all of the methods that have been applied. And this is a comparison of the final results. This is the standard model. This is the average of the results so far and this measurement of Bell 2 inclusive. So the way it works is it uses two machine learn uh, machine learning approaches so two bdts in a in combination uh, and it takes into account kinematics event shape vertex variables uh, all to suppress the background and uh, and also some yeah kinematics include the fact that kon is high momentum etc and this is where the, the signal uh, comes in in the red okay so what are we going to do is there a reason for um, having more data or a lot more data? Uh, I've talked to you a little bit about what we're expecting, uh, let's say in the next five years, up to around five inverse adder bonds. We're already starting to think about, well, what's gonna happen beyond Bell 2? Or at least, can we make sure we hit the, the uh, original target and then consider going on from there? But you need a physics motivation. So what can you do with a lot more data? 
Uh, so I've broken it down into a few different areas. Uh, one is new observables and channels uh, that uh, you can actually do with more data. Um, I talked about lepton flavor universality violation tests, uh, where you can start looking at B to U transitions, not just B to C. On Kabibo suppressed, uh, there are le purely leptonic decays that to date have been either poorly measured or uh, with no, no signal yet. Beta mu nu is one in that latter category. Uh, then uh, channels that open up uh, are uh, CP violation measurements in uh, B to S electroweak and radiative transitions. So these ones can be quite sensitive to right-handed currents. Um, on next category, I would, I'd say a kind of forbidden processes or dark sector. So you can look for feeble interactions in missing energy decays. These are very often difficult uh, to, to, to really probe to, 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 to new level without a lot more data. And left on flavor violation, which offers very good value. Um, third one is on classes of channels that have very low systematic uncertainties or very low theoretical uncertainties. LFUV tests, so ratios of electrons and muons, are typically uh, completely data-driven. But there's also hadronic uh, decay type measurements like Phi 3, which will continue to improve well beyond 50 inverse atovans. And I should also mention that, um, um, you know, once we achieve better precision, of course, we can measure larger energy scales and, and smaller couplings, but you can't do it without improvements to theory. Um, at the same time, we're expecting that the lattice QCD inputs on form factors, bag factors, decay constant uh, will evolve uh, according to their uh, to the stated schedules of the lattice groups. And that's really fundamental to saying that even on the hadronic side, that things will improve. So let's look at the Bell 2 projections and the comparison between Bell 2 and LHCV. So the first part I, of the, today's talk was on CP violation and roughly the, the current state, state of uh, state um, level of precision from B factory. So I showed you, for example, that Phi 3 measurement from Bell and Babar with 50 inverse autobahns. We're looking to push that down to around one and a half degrees and with five times more than that, well, well below one degree. Uh, Phi 2 was at about four degrees and this is statistics limited and will continue uh, to just improve according to our expectations. CK matrix element measurements, uh, ratios, as I said, are good ways of canceling theory errors and experiment errors. This will go well below 1% and continue to do so. So CK and precision measurements are a really good argument for a, for a new experiment. Searches for new physics, a CP violation in new physics, sorry, uh, new physics and CP violation. Um, it, all of these are very highly statistics limited if you look at look look closely. And that, yeah, that's a typo. Okay, so in this one, uh, we've got uh, searches for our kind of anomaly channels and also beyond that with purely leptonic. I think a highlight for the long term uh, are these two. So beta tau nu, um, where I currently have a precision of 24% or so. Uh, it's clear that this is not going to make a, a big impact at 24%. Um, but once we're able to push it down to somewhere between two and 4% with the upgrades, uh, this will be significant. Uh, in the case of beta K star and bar, they, that becomes a very high precision measurement uh, once you push beyond 50 inverse autobahns. Uh, and then finally on this table, uh, LFV. So LFV, lepton flavor violation, uh, generally in many channels are uh, uh, zero background tests. So you can push down to levels of uh, 10 to the minus 11 in this case. Just to give you an idea of uh, what these channels look like, uh, this is beta tau nu and beta mu nu. In the full bell data set, mu nu, which is green, uh, peaks under this, this region here in the lepton momentum. And you can quite clearly see this is a very challenging measurement. You need a lot of data to get to. In the case of beta tau nu, this is what the signal excess looks like. Again, um, more data will give more, more handles on reducing this background. I'll not go through the details here too much. 
uh, other than the, uh, perhaps just this last one, leptonic decays other than looking for new physics are an excellent way of getting out secant matrix elements. And that will actually work exceptionally well in the future since decay constants are, measured, are determined very well. Uh, another thing I'll just flash because I'm running out of time. And this is searches for dark sectors, uh, a really good motivation for, for future analyses. So we've talked about K and K star and Inu bar, but the same processes could be harboring uh, axion-like particles or dark photons or Higgs-like scalars that are invisible or long-lived. And there are many ways to probe for these that, that are being discussed in the literature uh, at the moment. It's actually one of the hot topics, I think. Um, so once we've pushed down to precision levels, um, we really start uh, constraining new phase space for, for these kinds of models. Uh, LFUV and LFE, I'll, I'll, I'll actually go past this one because of the time I've got, and this one as well. Okay, so let me get to the, to the Super Keck B and Bell 2 program. Uh, so what's happened so far, uh, phase one was in 2016, there was no detector. Phase two, uh, we had first collisions and pretty much a complete detector, except for the, the VXD that was partially incomplete. Sorry, I misread this one. First collisions, complete accelerator and an incomplete detector. Uh, this uh, meant that the vertex detector still had the background detector in it. And it was 2019 that we had uh, the detector with the one layer PXD. Um, so we had physics papers come out pretty soon after that in 2020, but it's been a, uh, a new and difficult accelerator uh, to work with. Um, you might have seen that some of our uh, projections for expected integrated luminosity haven't quite hit the mark on on, on what we were expecting to have by this time since we started. And again, that's due to complexities, it's due to operating during pandemic, et cetera. So the peak luminosity uh, already is getting to the super Keck B levels. Uh, the plan to go uh, a factor, a few more than this is identified, but then to go right to the nominal luminosity is still a challenge. So there's a, a program for this uh, on the machine level to get to that intermediate luminosity and then move to high luminosity. Uh, there are plans for uh, consolidating and completing the detector. So this is uh, our coming up um, shutdown will involve the installation of the pixel detector second layer and upgrades to the CD, uh, sorry, the PM, uh, top detector PMT replacements. That was a typo. And part three would be to improve the detector and that would be in the phase over here, essentially the long shutdown too. And this is the kind of preparation for that high luminosity scenario. Uh, so what are the motivations? These are written up in a Snowmass white paper on this. Uh, firstly, to improve the detector robustness against backgrounds and to have better safety factors for running at high luminosity uh, for, for some detectors. Uh, many of them can be affected by higher radiation levels so radiation resistance is important. Uh, and then to have the technology uh, work very well if the in interaction region needs to be redesigned for even higher luminosities. And the, my favorite one, which of course is to improve it just to get more, more physics for inverse outer bonds. So the, the top detector replacement I just mentioned uh, is a replacement of the photomultipliers. Uh, this is required because their efficiency drops off after uh, irradiation and they're being replaced with ones that will be uh, more radiation hard. Other detectors are coming in such as, um, or are being discussed, such as pix new pixel detectors uh, for uh, improved performance and robustness in the inner region, upgrades to the KLM strips on the outer region of the detector and upgrades to the CDC readout. This picture um, gives a bit of a rundown of of all the areas that are being considered as part of this write-up. Um, not all of them will go through, uh, but the, the, the discussion is currently open to, to understand this. Um, so the bunch of options for pixel detectors, um, there's gonna be upgrades associated to the, the trigger to allow better bandwidth. I mentioned the CDC upgrade for improved readout. So this improves radiation tolerance, the calorimeter, there is consideration for uh, pure cesium iodide in some parts and to replace the photosensors 
uh, that are there with these avalanche photodiodes. Uh, on the KLM side, uh, some of the layers still have um, RPCs and it would be to replace them with scintillators. Uh, on the top side I mentioned, uh, and there, then there are some areas of novel R&D, such as stuffing all of the, the gaps in the particle ID acceptance uh, with high performance detectors so that you, you improve your vetoes and, and so on. And uh, yeah, that's for those. I'm not gonna go through this one too much detail. The, the idea here is just to show that a lot of the upgrades that I've just talked about uh, either in that second long shutdown, so around 2026, or at least nominally in this plan, or in some cases, they'll be just before it in the case of the CDC, and that there are some that are longer term, the calorimeter at the, and some of these at the bottom here. Um, so that goes from uh, transitioning from uh, purely uh, Bell 2 program to a, Bell, a beyond Bell 2 program. And just to state that a lot of the perform, you know, th these upgrades have to take into account um, what their impact and the challenges will be for different physics areas. So each one of these detector upgrades will have an impact in different areas of performance, and hence they'll have different uh, impact on different physics channels. So there's a, now a, we're in a period of transitioning this to a, a construction project uh, once uh, the uh, Super Kek B International Task Force uh, uh, reaches its conclusion about its plans, then this, uh, the upgrade conceptual design report will be written for the program. Okay, um, that's all from me. Uh, the data set's actually quite large already, uh, 316 per Svampter bonds. Performance is doing uh, generally as good as or better than Bell 2, or Bell 1. I showed you some highlights, uh, plus some from Bell. And uh, exactly how we can get to 50 inverse autobahns, which is going to have to include uh, some types of upgrades as we go along. Okay, that's all. Thank you, Phil. That was an excellent talk, and I learned a great deal from it. So the, your talk is now open for questions or comments. Can I ask one question, Tom? I can barely hear. Yes, somebody wants to ask a question. Please proceed. Uh, your volume is so low, we cannot hear it. Okay. Uh, let me adjust uh, my volume. In the meantime, somebody else can ask a question. Let me just adjust this. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, next question, and then we'll go back to the uh, whoever was uh, speaking first. Uh, who, let's see. I, I, I can't see from my display who was asking the question, but if your volume is okay, please proceed now. Hello, Philip, it's, is it better now? Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Okay. Hear you. So, yeah, so uh, I have a question regarding inclusive uh, decay. Uh, so if one considers uh, B2U L new inclusive, is it possible to also uh, look for uh, an additional hard photon with this uh, kind of a decay? Sorry, I had my mic, mic muted. Um, I think you were talking about this channel, is that correct? Yes, yes. So I, I, my question is, can one look at B2 XU, L nu and a hard photon? We, so a high energy photon coming out and what, what would be the motivation for that one? I guess okay. I guess you could, but it, it, it's, uh, a little, it's a little difficult, right? Oh, okay. No, so motivation was we were just trying to uh, look at how to extract the non perturbative parameters and it looks like we have not completed the calculation, but it looks like that there may be a useful thing because uh, from the very preliminary results that we get from computing uh, one part of the uh, rate, uh, looks like that some of the non perturbative uh, parameters can come out uh, more cleanly, at least theoretically. We have not completed the calculation. We have not completed the calculation. So that's a caveat. Yeah, so th this probably comes to the method when you do this analysis, you reconstruct this X system, uh, you reconstruct the invariant mass of it by looking at uh, looking for uh, tracks and for photons or pi zeros in, in, in that part of the event. 
uh, normally we, we look for everything and if it has a significant amount of momentum uh, above some detection thresholds, then we'll include it in the four vector of that X system. But typically we don't normally break, you know, we don't normally search for a, a high energy photon component in there. I guess largely maybe it, because it could come from a pi zero and you need to know that it hasn't. Uh, but if it's an interesting proposal, uh, I guess we can, we can we can see what could be done experimentally. Okay, thanks. Thank okay, uh, ne next question or comment? Um, if I don't hear one right away, I was, I think earlier in your talk, you, you zip through the uh, dark sector work, which I think uh, is of great interest. So maybe you want to show the two slides you skipped. I think it could be this one. Okay. Um, there, the two, there are two channels that I've got here. Um, one of them is looking for um, B to a K on plus an ALP where the ALP decays invisibly. Uh, th this was a theoretical analysis and it was a reinterpretation of the Babar search of B to K in a new bar. The, the principle here is that um, the, the ALP will have some specific mass. And if you scan for the recoil mass of that ALP, then you're able to determine its, its presence since the background will be completely flat. Um, so that can be done in the K on channel, the pi on, you can look for proton ones, if you're looking for baryonic dark matter, there's a whole bunch of categories that you can do here. Um, we've actually done some, some sensitivity studies in, with, with, with Bell and Bell 2 MC, and we've actually found that where it's labeled Bell 2 for the full data set is actually not quite so correct. That's what we expect with what we've got already. So Bell 2 should be able to go well, well beyond that. On the one on the right, uh, it's a channel involving a Higgs-like scalar. So it's a similar scenario. Um, you'll have a K, a K on or a K star, and then a Higgs-like scalar. Uh, in this paper, it was denoted an S uh, that can have a displaced vertex. So it will decay after some period of time. Uh, it's showing three, three regions, one where it's reconstructed in the dimuon, di tau, or a, a dihadron final state. You do the same, you do something similar, but in this case, you're looking for uh, a resonance peak uh, with a large displacement. And it's been evaluated that, that uh, because of the relatively low momentum in, in Bell 2, you, you have a slightly better uh, sensitivity uh, to this coupling space versus mass because it's, it doesn't boost outside of the acceptance of the detector. So th this is quite promising. Um, as, a, as a category of measurement that Bell 2 will come out with in the future. Okay, uh, so let's see, the, the dark sector stuff you talk about here is from B decays, not directly from E plus and minus. That's right, yeah. So I, we have a great deal of activity on that front too. Yeah, I, I guess due to the, due, due to, um, the, the name of the, the conference, I kept it to these topics, but yeah. I, I don't think I've got any, I don't think I, rec I don't recall putting slides on that in this, in this presentation. But yeah, you can do complementary things. Um, in, in, those, in this case, you're, if, if, if you look, the, the coupling here is between the ALP and the W. If you look in uh, the scattering processes, you might be looking at ALPs coupling to, a, uh, to, to, to something else. Uh, so they, they provide complementary inputs. Okay, uh, so let's continue. Uh, maybe some other questions have developed since uh, since uh, you showed the slide. Can I ask a question here? Sure. Uh, this was, uh, thanks very much for uh, asking <laughs> him to show these two slides because I find them also very interesting. Now, the question I had, was uh, this is uh, you have you said that the bell two limit should in fact go down re in real life uh, beyond what is shown in the central figure. So uh, for uh, uh, sort of phenomenologists, what would be your uh, uh, guide to tell how we can 
estimate that? I mean, is there some instructions to us for that? I'm I'm glad that there were questions on this topic because my uh, I have a PhD student uh, working on this exact topic uh, to to provide some kind of even Monte Carlo based sensitivities for for, for these channels. Uh, so I'd, I'd be very happy to follow up if you'd like to uh, afterwards. Okay. No, because I just felt that clearly you said the improvement is in the belt too, um, that is going to be really because of some issues with, I mean, some betterment in the analysis. And yeah. for a phenomenologist to implement that, we would need guidance from you guys exactly what we should uh, put. It's not just a question of increased luminosity or something like that. Yeah. So the way that the, if you, the, the previous measurement done by Baba was like, for a beta k nu nu bar, and then they binned the their, their search uh, in in missing mass squared bins. So these are actually really very wide, much much wider than the recoil uh, that you get from from the Alp in this case. Okay. So a dedicated search can look in a much 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 narrower window, and that's why the sensitivity is much better. Okay. So at least this is the physics uh, reason that would be there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for this. And this is because I find it very interesting if you are able to go down even further. Uh, oh, great. With Bell 2. So but we're never, we're not going to get to the K on level, but we'll, yeah, it'll be better. So thanks. It did. would be nice to see exactly where you go with this. I mean, that would, I think a lot of theorists would be interested in this. Thanks. Um, let's see uh, if it's if it's okay with Jim. I would like to allow for another question or two. Uh, uh, yeah, that's fine. But the next talk is at uh, in another ten minutes. So okay, so let's, let's continue. Then uh, <laughs> other questions or comments. Um, you had a, 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 a plot, I think it was around page 40 on the uh, relative sensitivities and complementarity between LHCB and, and Bell 2 in the long-term future. So uh, can you try to distill what are the, rel the, the strengths of the two programs and the complementarity? For Bell 2 and LHCB? Yes, yes. Uh, right. It's 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 kind of funny this one. Um, we have our prejudices on what we think we're, we're better at, and <laughs> so uh, it, as I've got listed over here, we're generally more sensitive if there's one or more neutrinos in the final state. Uh, that's that's a general argument, um, particularly when we're looking for say k nu nu bar mu nu these purely leptonic ones where you don't have a well defined vertex. Uh, we can constrain um, a background. Um, it's also the, the case if you're looking for channels with a with a tau in the final state. I'd say generally we should have better prospects for for precision. Uh, but you know LHCB is done very well on this channel. Haven't seen anything on this one. Uh, there's maybe not enough constraint. Then there's uh, inclusive channels. I didn't uh, in this in this table. Uh, emphasize this so much, but inclusive decays means that we look at uh, some of exclusive uh, hadronic final states that through uh, essentially uh, quark hadron duality effect, you can describe the transition as a quark level transition. And so you use a different theoretical approach. And you can do that in a, in a B factory because you can either sum up many states or you can inclusively reconstruct like we do for VUB. Uh, that's almost prohibitive in LHCB. Um, then there's time-dependent CP violation, which kind of is, a, I think, a little bit of a surprise in that the fundamental requirements are that you have a good precision measurement of, of delta Z and uh, flavor tagging. And LHCB's flavor tagging isn't as good, but it, it doesn't account for... It, it doesn't... Um, uh, it's, it's not the, it's essentially compensated, usually it should be compensated by the much larger production fractions. So it's the, the precision there um, turns out that it's slightly better in the case of, of uh, Bell 2 for the channels that we use from B sub D uh, 
because of the present of presence often of a case short, and that tends to fly out of the acceptance of, of, of LHCB. And then tau physics generally is stronger. Uh, on LHCB, of course, they've got very high production rates. They've got access to B sub S, lambda B. Uh, they can look at K on decay. Um, uh, so they've got all the hadron flavors. They've got a huge boost, so they can measure fast B sub S oscillations. They can measure very rare decays as well. So B to mu mu, B to, uh, B to pi mu mu. Um, they've definitely got a, a very strong advantage there. there. There are areas of overlap that are quite interesting. One of them, I think, is K star LL. They're, they're, they're past us now, of course, um, but uh, the precision test that we need to do is in the electron channel, and that's where that's where they've got more more data, but we've got better resolution, so it's really nicely complementary. Yeah, I think that's the loop. <laughs> um, let's see. The, there is no LHCb entry for alpha phi two. Uh, yeah, I don't, that's be, that's because they don't provide enough information for an independent extraction of that parameter. So I've not put it in the table. It would have had to have utilized other inputs directly from B factories. That, that's not to say they're not providing input, it's just you just can't use it alone. So you need to, maybe a star. <laughs> and for K star new new bar, does that include the latest uh, ROE tagging methodology in the sensitivities? That one doesn't, not yet. Yeah. Okay, so they may be even better. Yeah, could, yeah, it definitely could be. Um, I mean, the, the current one is definitely a lot more more powerful. But I, I guess after that first publication, now we've got a lot more data that is that is being uh, studied. Uh, we'll, we'll have a better handle on perhaps the systematic errors and potential bias in in a in a more inclusive approach, and that makes it easier to extrapolate. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question before the next talk. Are there any uh, questions or comments? Okay, uh, if not, uh, then I would like to thank Phil again uh, for an excellent talk and uh,